Okay, so it does appear our attendees are rolling down a little bit. So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brittany Millick. I'm the Director of Communications with PAMIC. And I'm here to welcome you all to our webinar today, Human Factors Engineering, presented by Jody DeMarco and Tom O'Brien of FCNA Partners. Now, before we begin, I just wanted to go through a couple functions with you. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. As well, this webinar will be recorded and will be on demand on the PAMIC website after we end. And as well, Jody, if you wouldn't mind scrolling to the next slide. As a reminder, we wanted to thank our Platinum sponsors. Without them, we would not have such a successful event or live events in the future. As a reminder as well, our 2021 annual sponsorships are available for registration on the PAMIC website if you have interest in putting your logo up on the screen. So now I will pass it over to Tom to introduce FCNA Partners and the rest of the presentation. Good morning, everybody. This is Tom O'Brien. I'm the regional manager in Pennsylvania for FCNA Partners Incorporated. We're a regional forensic engineering and forensic consulting company. We have offices in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, Trevos, Pennsylvania, Fl Floorham Park, New Jersey. And we provide a variety of forensic engineering and forensic consulting services, including forensic accounting for insurance companies, employers, and third-party administrators. Our, present, our speaker today is Jody DeMarco. Jody is our Vice President of Engineering at FCNA Partners, and I'm going to pass it on to him to give his intro. Jody, you're up. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Brittany, and thank you all for attending today's uh, seminar. It is a one-hour discussion on human factors engineering. And uh, there will be about five or 10 minutes at the end of the discussion for, uh, for questions. Uh, there's a Q&A button. If you uh, think of questions during the presentation, please type them in and Tom will monitor those questions. At, and at the end of the uh, presentation, we'll go through as many questions as we can. My name is Jody DeMarco. Uh, I'm the Vice President of uh, FCNA Partners, 1990 graduate of Rutgers University College of Engineering with a degree in civil uh, engineering and a concentration in structural engineering. Uh, I'm a member of ASCE, uh, the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, and the Academy of Forensic uh, Engineers. I'm a professional engineer in New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, uh, Virginia, and uh, maybe some other states that I just can't remember right now. Uh, you might say to yourself, well, why is a civil structural engineer giving a talk on human factors engineering? You might also be asking, oh, sorry about that, I accidentally hit you. Uh, you might also be saying, what is human factors uh, engineering? Very simply, human factors uh, basically incorporates how people react with the built environment. Uh, in other words, how do people walk on stairs? How do people traverse uh, a sidewalk or a driveway? And things like that. Well, we're gonna go into a lot more detail of what it means, but in a very, very simply in a nutshell, how do people interact with the built environment? Human factors also gets into how people interact with machines, and things like that. But for our discussion, we're gonna talk about the built environment. Um, so I, w when I speak with a client, many times they're uncertain whether they need an engineer, a biomedical expert, a biomechanical expert, or a human factors expert. And uh, what I usually try to uh, discuss with them is if you have an engineer who has a background in human factors, who's a member of the Human Factors and Economic Society, that could be the, the ideal fit for many of your cases. Uh, I always say it's a multi-prong approach. And one thing I probably should have said in the beginning of this, this presentation that we're going through today, it is available if you reach out to Tom, uh, Tom O'Brien, he can uh, email you a PDF version of this presentation so you don't have to take notes or anything like that. Um, just reach out to Tom at the end of the presentation. He'll be happy to uh, send you a copy of this. Um, also, you might want a copy because some of the things I talk through really fast. 
Uh, getting back to the approach, and um, I always say it's a multi-prong approach. Uh, typically, expert reports that I review that come in from the other side usually uh, approach it just from the engineering uh, aspect. In other words, the engineering design of a facility, and let's just talk about a staircase, uh, for example, how the uh, stairs were designed, how they were uh, constructed, how are they built, how are they maintained, and it usually also includes a code review. Did they meet the proper uh, riser and tread height? Was the handrail the proper height? Uh, and all of those kinds of aspects. Uh, what, what I think is a very effective way uh, to uh, approach these cases, in addition to the engineering approach, is the second prong approach, which are human factor considerations. And human factors considerations include the uh, the person themselves for example if uh, somebody falls down a set, set of stairs we look into uh th that person if that person recently had a knee surgery or a hip surgery that could be a factor if the person was prescribed glasses and was not wearing their glasses that could be a factor if the person was carrying a uh, extraordinarily heavy bag or if um or or, or if there's some other uh condition uh, that, uh, or if they were carrying a baby, for an example, that they, something like that, that could put the person's uh, normal center of gravity uh, off of the center of gravity, then that could be a factor uh, also to consider. We'll get into more of those, but the, the concept is taking all of these aspects, the engineering design, the construction, the maintenance, the code review, and the human factors consideration, and developing a comprehensive report considering all of those. Now, what allows you know me, what allows DeMarco to include all of these things in a report? <clears throat> There's an ASTM standard. ASTM is American Standard for uh, Testing, ASTM E678. And if you've seen any of my reports, you will see that I reference this in every one of my reports. I reference this in all of my reports and I would suggest to you to also require that whatever expert you have working on a case or preparing a report for you to also uh, include this uh, reference as a citation in the report uh, for a couple reasons. One, it, it outlines a scientific methodology, a consensus standard scientific methodology that an engineer or an expert should follow. It's only a couple pages long. It's not very difficult or, or complicated to read. But what this does is this document shows a judge, for an example, that the report is prepared uh, using the scientific methodology. Some of the, um, some of the text from the, this, uh, this document, uh, uh, this practice, uh, ASTM 677, uh, practice for evaluation of scientific or technical data. This practice establishes criteria for evaluating scientific and technical data and other relevant considerations which constitute acceptable basis for forming scientific or technical expert opinions. This, this bullet point right here is so important because as an engineer, you would expect that I could incorporate all of those engineering and design uh, type uh, of discussions into my report. ASTM uh, 678, it tells us that we can uh, consider uh, even more than that. And so that's where this allows us to include evaluation of medical reports. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't evaluate it from that point of view. But if I look at a, uh, uh, a primary doctor's report that discusses uh, uh, somebody being on certain medications that can affect their balance or can affect their vision or affect their gait, uh, that uh, this document allows me to include that because it is relevant and significant. Uh, this practice uh, uh, recommends generally accepted professional practices, although the facts and issues of each situation require specific consideration. Uh, persons engaged in forensic investigations are responsible for identifying significant data. They uh, then analyze and correlate the data and report conclusions and opinions. Uh, some other uh, uh, phrases from uh, ESTM, uh, ASTM E678, the evaluation uh, procedure involves preparing and maintaining 
logical and traceable record of analysis and deduction. So one of the things I say that's so important in any expert report that you get is that it's traceable. And what that word means is considering the documents that were reviewed and considering the unique circumstances of the event, the report should be laid out such that anybody <clears throat> who reviews the same documents and follows the same process should reasonably come to the same or a very similar conclusion. And that's what the traceable method is, logical and traceable, laying out all the file materials that were reviewed, laying out, not, not cherry picking, just certain things that work for, you know, for, your, for the argument's advantage, but laying out all of the information and doing an analysis of the code or the, uh, or, or, or the deposition or whatever it may be, and laying that narrative out. Which, which provides a log logical and traceable explanation. The, uh, the evaluation <clears throat> process is based on information collected and is intended to determine the most logical and reasonable scientific explanation of the incident, accounting for all significant data. Again, we're not just cherry picking certain data that we like, we consider it all. Some of the examples of the data could include physical characteristics of a person, the dates, the time, the location, uh, physical injuries to the person, and damage to objects. So I just want to concentrate a, a little bit on this. Um, well, when I talk about the characteristics of the person, clearly that's focusing just on the human factors. Obviously, if the person fell on a stairway, we would also consider the characteristics of the stairway and the handrail and things uh, of that nature. But as it relates to the person and the way the person perceives that stairway or the location where they may have fallen are the dates, time, and location. The dates, very important. Uh, as you know, this time of the year, it gets dark around 5 p.m. In July, it gets dark much later. Understanding the date when an event happened is very important. Understanding the time when it happened is also very important. If somebody fell uh, you know, during the nighttime, uh, in, uh, in an area that may not be well lit. We also consider the date to take a look at the sky conditions and the moon phase. Uh, to, and of course, we would go out there with our light meter to see what the actual uh, illumination levels were. Very important to understand the times and the dates that a fall occurred. I, I have a, in a, a picture a little later in this presentation which will kind of drive that point home. So we'll get back to to that in a second. Uh, so when we, when we start, uh, since ASTM 678 allows us uh, as engineers with a, a background in human factors uh, to, to start uh, to consider uh, the plaintiff and the plaintiff's condition, uh, we, we have to consider how we uh, develop our report. And what I, the next few slides are going to be how we uh, set the discussion of the report, what the objective are, of our report is. So there's multiple ways to define the objective or the, the problem being considered in order to comply with ASTM 678. <clears throat> For example, and I took these just from a couple of my reports. Uh, you can, my reports or a report could say something to the effect you specifically asked me to determine whether the design and maintenance of the accident area complied with all applicable codes, requirements, and standard industry practices intended to provide reasonable, to provide a reasonably safe walking surface per, for pedestrians wear, wearing ordinary footwear. Again, so as not to confuse the issue, uh, defining the statement exactly what the purpose of the report is. Uh, the reason I selected this uh, section of one of the reports I wrote, it's, it's a classic example. So many times, well, not so many times, but uh, several times I've been called uh, uh, where the plaintiff is an elderly person who is wearing very high heels walking through a restaurant. And uh, the, the, the plaintiff may have had uh, uh, conditions, maybe a knee replacement, maybe arthritis or something like that. So, uh, so very important, reasonably safe walking surface for pedestrians wearing ordinary footwear. 
So, you know, you, we can make the argument, is it reasonable for an 80 year old person with recent knee surgery walking on a tile floor with, uh, with five inch stilettos? Uh, we would put that into the argument. Another way to define uh, <clears throat> the problem or the objective of the report is to say something like uh, whether any theory or opinion that uh, say contractor is anyway responsible for the incident or any claimed injury of plaintiff can withstand a challenge of reasonable scientific and engineering examination when considering the facts and circumstances unique to this incident. So basically we're defining what the objective of the report is. And of course, all of the, uh, all of the uh, information, the findings in the report will support the conclusions ultimately that will go back to, uh, to that definition of what the purpose of the report is. I have a couple more examples here, whether the flooring in the area of this incident provided a slip resistant surface in accordance with longstanding BOCA and then current ICC building code requirements. Do many, many of these reports that involve uh, a floor, especially in grocery stores where there may be a spilled item. Uh, again, we consider the floor, the material itself, the footwear the person was wearing, uh, we'll take a look at sweep logs, how frequently the store uh, maintenance uh, took care of this floor or, or what they did. And we'll also go out and do a site inspection to measure the coefficient of friction or very simply put the traction of the floor itself to see if there's anything wrong with the material composition of the, uh, the floor. So uh, just some examples of how we can define what the objective of the report is. Uh, just a couple more examples. I'm going to skip through those. Uh, I think you get the point. The other ASTM standard that should be included in all in all in forensic reports is ASTM 2713. Uh, this is the standard guide for forensic engineering. It defines what an engineering ex well, actually it defines what an expert is. An individual with specialized knowledge, skills, and abilities acquired through appropriate education, training, and experience. Forensic engineering is the application in the art of, and science of engineering and matters which are or may possibly relate to the jurisprudence system inclusive of alternative dispute resolutions. So my point is it's very uh, important to include ASTM 678 and ASTM 2713. Again, including these items uh, allows a judge or an attorney on the other side to know that uh, that the writer of the report followed a consensus standard methodology in the report preparation. And since these, at the very minimum, since these two standards are followed, there's very little likelihood that a report uh, could be thrown out uh, based on a net opinion. A very important, uh, once an expert report is deemed to be a net opinion, the report goes away and the expert goes away and sometimes uh, a big strength of your case could go away also. So very important at the very minimum, if I can impress anything upon you to, uh, to ask your experts to include uh, at least these two, uh, these two ASTM standards. In fact, when I look at a report that comes in from the other side, one of the things I look for in my critique of the report is to see if they follow any kind of scientific methodology. And if they don't, I, I criticize them for it. Uh, so just, uh, to, just as a point of note, uh, it's very important to include those. Uh, th now this, this is taken right out of uh, ASTM 2713. Physical systems and their behaviors are complex. Engineering analysis may facilitate simplified representation of the properties and behaviors of physical systems so that they may be better understood. The testifying engineer's goal is to explain the broader concepts and the details of a particular system or behavior in a way that may allow the triers of fact to adequately understand the essentials of the physical system. Further, the engineer's goal is to clearly describe the investigative and analytic methods that were used, uh, the reason those methods were selected and the basis for his, his or her opinions with the investigative scope of the case. So very important, this boils it down to exactly what the uh, forensic engineer's role is. It lays it all out right there. Uh, in many ways, 
uh, an expert, in this case, forensic engineer, uh, needs to be a teacher. Uh, if the person is up, uh, if the expert is on the stand, they need to be able to describe the, uh, the conditions uh, and be able to relate to all of the members of the jury, to the judge and to the attorneys. Uh, so in many ways, it is a, a teaching role. Uh, and, and I would suggest that, uh, or, or I would say that this is not, uh, an expert should never come from a place of arrogance or a person who, know, who acts like they know the most, uh, but more come from a point uh, of view of a teacher, someone who's trying to uh, describe what the conditions are. Now for a set of stairs, we've all walked stairs thousands of times, pretty easy for people to understand that. But as we get into more complicated cases where it may be a, uh, a work site where there are multiple contractors on the site, or if we're talking about um, a construction or a type of construction methodology that uh, people may not be familiar with, it becomes very important that your expert uh, have the skills to, uh, to, communicate, uh, to communicate those effectively. So, so we kind of talked about um, human factors, what it is, uh, the ASTM standards that should be used in a report. So let's, let's talk about the definition of human factors. And I pulled these from a, a few different sources. The field of human factors in ergonomics is, is uh, economics is diverse and multidisciplinary. Uh, the human factors in ergonomic society definition defines defines it as uh, economic, uh, ergonomics or human factors is the scientific discipline concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of a system and the profession that applies theory, principle, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. Like I said early, earlier, in a nutshell, uh, I see human factors simply as how do people interact with the built environment. There's a few other uh, definitions, uh, we should probably go through those. And uh, I apologize if I'm being a little clumsy here. The, uh, the way Zoom is set up, it sets up my bar so it interferes with some of the, uh, some of the text that's on these slides. So I have to keep uh, bouncing my bar around. So uh, anyway, um, human factors is the field which is involved in conducting research regarding human. Uh, physiological, social, physical, and biological characteristics, maintaining the information obtained from that research and working to apply that information with respect to the design, operation, and use of products or systems for optimizing human performance, health, safety, and or habitability. It's pretty straightforward, intuitive stuff. Um, another definition just from uh, uh, scientific literature, human factors engineering is the application of uh, human factors information to the design of tools, machines, systems, tasks, jobs, and environments for safe, comfortable, and effective human use. Uh, the definition from the Transportation Research Board, uh, as applied to highway safety, human factors is concerned with the design of the roadway and operating environment and the vehicle. Human factors have shaped the uh, evaluation of site distance requirements, work zone layouts, uh, sign placement and spacing criteria, dimensions uh, for road markings and color specifications and uh, signal timing. Um, way back uh, when I was a young engineer in the 1990s, I worked for the city of Philadelphia Department of Streets. We did bridge and highway design, and which also included uh, signal timing. We incorporated all of these aspects, site distance requirements, work zone layouts for, uh, for, for detours and lane closures. Uh, placements of sign, uh, uh, pavement markings, the color of signs, which, uh, which is set in the MUTCD, and of course, uh, signal timing. Uh, all of these, uh, tons of research that goes in behind these codes uh, that are developed for, uh, for roadway and highway design and uh, construction, uh, uh, construction work layout is all based on research. And there are many, many codes which need to be followed, which are based on the research. So human factors, uh, the, the codes have already have a lot of this baked into it. Just uh, some more of the definition from the Transportation Research Board. 
Uh, engineers can design, can design roadways, traffic control devices and vehicles, but they cannot design road users. So very important. And that's where the human factors come in. For example, um, there are many roads, especially in the older parts of Pennsylvania and New Jersey that were just basically paths at one time that uh, over time developed into paved roads, which uh, do not necessarily meet any design criteria where there is a design exception for, uh, for those roads. Maybe the curve is a very tight curve, but due to uh, buildings nearby or, or the landscape or, uh, or streams or creeks or rivers or for whatever, uh, they don't necessarily meet the, uh, the, the code for, for buildings. So, so those are considerations. And we also have to consider how the person uh, can see that road in the nighttime if it's well lit that the pavement markings are maintained uh, and also what the uh, driver was doing, especially now with the use of cell phones and people being distracted with phones and texting and things like that. Um, so very important concepts. So just uh, again, I apologize. I know the first uh, 15 or 20 minutes of this presentation can be a little bit dry because we're just uh, in engineering terms, we're just laying the foundation of what it is that uh, we're talking about and what human factors are, but we need to lay that foundation so we can build upon that. And part of that foundation is the terminology that's used uh, uh, for these investigation. Uh, for example, uh, attention, state of assessing the physical and informational environment, including mental activities, uh, the built environment, which I mentioned several times, the definition is uh, areas such as sidewalks, roadways, and structures that have been built or maintained uh, for use by people. I'm going to skip through some of these definitions. You can always get this from uh, Tom if you like. Uh, civil twilight, period of twilight, beginning or ending when the center of uh, the sun is more than six degrees below horizon. Uh, coatings, typically on walking surfaces. Very important one as uh, a coefficient of friction. Uh, very simply, uh, most people refer to it as traction. It's the ratio of the friction, uh, friction force to the force usually gravitational at the, at per, and, at and perpendicular to two surfaces in contact. Um, there are several devices which can measure the coefficient of friction depending on which type is being used to measure a floor's coefficient of friction depends on what uh, what the standards tell us is acceptable or what is below acceptable. We can have a, a two hour presentation just on the evaluation of a coefficient of friction uh, cases, uh, but, uh, but that definition is there. Some other definition, uh, cognitive reaction time, distractions, uh, foreseeable pedestrian path, uh, I have a really good picture that demonstrates that. So I'm gonna uh, skip through some of this. Um, line of sight, so important, uh, not only for vehicles, for example, uh, at intersections. I've worked on several cases where um, a vehicle comes to uh, a four-way or a, a stop sign uh, at a, uh, at a four-way intersection and the bushes are not trimmed back, which limits the person's uh, sight triangle, their line of sight for oncoming traffic. Uh, and the person has to inch out slowly and perhaps hits someone on a bicycle who's coming in the opposite direction of where the uh, driver is looking, or if, if a car comes uh, at an unusually high rate of speed. So line of sight, very important, especially for uh, sight triangles. Also very important for, uh, for pedestrians walking uh, uh, in an area where there may be uh, a staircase that is unexpected. For example, maybe a change in elevation uh, that is just one single step down or say two single steps down uh, at nighttime when it may not be uh, obvious or apparent or poorly lit, which gets into luminance, area of light reflected from an object or a surface uh, illumination levels, measurement of light hitting a surface. Um, there's many different models of light meters that can be used to measure uh, the uh, illumination level at a given place, which is why I recommend always doing a site inspection as close to the time of day 
as it occurred with the with similar or the same lighting conditions. So we can understand whether lighting was a concern or whether we can rule the lighting uh, concern out of the uh, discussion. So very, very, very important uh, concepts and uh, very easy to measure. Uh, maintenance, when we talk about uh, floors, there's a couple of different aspects of floors we have to consider. One, how it was designed, is it flat, stable, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and doesn't move under somebody's feet. There's also the material composition of the flooring material, which, uh, which is what we measure when we measure the coefficient of friction. And we also have to consider the maintenance of the floor, how frequently it's waxed or how infrequently it's cleaned. Uh, for example, grocery store, if there's spilled items on the floor, we have to consider that. Uh, also, um, there's a few other definitions. Again, I'm only going to go through a couple of them. Uh, pedestrian gate patterns. Uh, now, gate is simply the process of bipedal movement consisting of, pedestrian, uh, consisting of pedestrians' weight being supported primarily by alternate feet on level surfaces, stair, ascent, and descent. Now, a pedestrian gate is so important to consider because if you think of it in very simple terms, a, a one-year-old who is learning to walk has a very different gait than a, an athletic 30-year-old person as opposed to um, an 80-year-old person who, uh, who either needs a cane or a walker or something like that. Their gaits are very different. Uh, my point is throughout, uh, throughout a person's lifetime, their gait changes. And even, even if they are young and relatively healthy, their gait can change from injury. Um, for, for example, athletic injuries or something like that, the time when they're going through uh, rehabilitation, uh, their gait may be changed than their normal gait. So very important concept to understand that gait changes. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's often, uh, I mean, it may sound funny, but for example, an elderly person who has always worn the same type of, say, uh, shoes, uh, of heels, for example, and when they get to a certain age, uh, they don't have the same gait, uh, but they think they can still wear those types of heels, and for pride reasons or whatever, they don't want to, uh, can see that they probably should not be wearing those types of shoes. So a very important consideration um, in our evaluation. Uh, peripheral vision, I've got a good example of, uh, of this coming up, so I'll skip through that. Uh, many of these definitions are, uh, are kind of uh, intuitive. Uh, this one picture, uh, this was a, uh, a, a stairway in a, uh, this was in a hotel. And this was the bar area, and in this area, they, in the morning, they would set up uh, the breakfast buffet. And it was an elderly woman who was with her younger son, and she uh, she was walking to the buffet <clears throat> area. Excuse me, and uh, she fell down these stairs. So, from a human factor standpoint, uh, I would be looking for a couple things. One, I'm not sure if you could see my cursor, but along the edge of the carpet there is a silver uh, nosing at the edge of the the floor. There's a step down to another step, and then there is a sil another silver nosing, uh, which is, uh, is pretty reflective with my flash of the camera that I took. This is an example of a high contrast visual cue that someone approaching these stairs, uh, if they were looking down, would have uh, seen. Uh, the railing that the person on the left is holding onto also provides another visual cue which alerts somebody that, that uh, they are approaching a change in elevation. And uh, another factor is the gentleman in the front who has already stepped down the stairs is about the same height as plaintiff's uh, son was. Now, the big question is why wasn't the son helping his mom down the stairs as most sons would do, but that's not for me to judge on. But uh, one of the things plaintiff uh, said in her testimony was that as she approached the stairs, she saw her son and she saw him as he went off in the distance, he appeared, appeared to get shorter. So that is also another visual cue that that would alert her 
that there is a change of elevation, that her son's height relative to hers is getting lower. So she had multiple, uh, multiple cues in her uh, field of view that uh, should have uh, alerted her that she was approaching a change in elevation. So those are um, some of the things that would be in her field of view. It demonstrates some of the concepts that we're talking about. This is uh, an example of a, a store uh, where the, uh, the, door, uh, the, the door, this is an antique store where the door is uh, pretty much kept open. The situation on this case involves a, a woman who had a, uh, a toddler who was about three or four years old, uh, went running out of the store. Uh, the mother went to run after her toddler uh, where the, the threshold for the door is, is a small step down to the landing. And what you cannot see in this picture is there is a slate step that blends in very well with the uh, sidewalk below uh, because she was rushing after uh, her toddler and, and was focusing on where the toddler was going, uh, not into the street. She did not see the, uh, the, the slate step. So is it reasonable to think under those conditions that she should have perceived that step, uh, even considering that there is a silver nosing at the edge of that, uh, of that uh, landing. This, uh, th this next photo, uh, another case that I worked on, uh, involves a, uh, uh, a patron of a gym who, uh, who was at the gym and the way this gym was designed included what they called a cardio platform. And this cardio platform, you could see the elliptical machines on the right side of the, uh, of the floor. And then the platform was about six inches elevated above the main floor. Uh, the plaintiff, uh, rather than walking around the walking path, uh, walked in between the, these elliptical machines, did not anticipate this single step down uh, and did not see the single step down because his body was turned uh, to squeeze through the elliptical machines, which did not allow him to have a direct uh, uh, straightforward view of this uh, silver uh, nosing that was on the edge of the uh, that was on the edge of the platform that would alert him that there is a single step down. So, the, uh, so these are just a, a few examples uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of some of the concepts we're talking about. Now, this next photograph is what I, I talked about earlier, how we want to, uh, ideally, we like to do a site inspection at the same time that an incident occurred. This photo uh, I'm showing you here, a walkway with a limited illumination from tree shadows. This is a perfect example. Um, the attorney I was working with on this case wanted to go out in the middle of the day and uh, I had to be difficult with him. And I had to say, listen, we, we need to go out at night. We need to see what the lighting conditions were at this. Um, uh, we met out there, I think it was about one in the morning. And in doing that, what we learned is that when plaintiff was at the rear of the building, which is along the right side of this photograph, and as the plaintiff uh, was walking and turned the corner, uh, the light, I took this picture and there is a, uh, uh, a street lamp or a parking lot light post directly behind me. And between me and the corner of the building is a very large tree and you could see the shadow that the lamp post uh, and the tree cast on the corner of this building. So when this plaintiff turned the corner of the building from the back of the building, which you can see, which is really well lit by the two low shrubs back here. Uh, when he turned this corner, there was a cable a coax cable from the uh, cable company, which was laying across the sidewalk, which he could not see because it was being, uh, uh, it was basically in the shadow of the uh, tree. Had we done this inspection uh, in the middle of the day with daylight, we would have never learned that there was such a large shadow cast in this corner of the building. Where the other parts of the parking lot are very, uh, are illuminated very well, this picture was taken, taken without a flash. So you could see, you could see the, the line stripes for the parking stalls, you could see the curbs, you could see every brick in that building, except where the, uh, where the shadow is cast, which is right where the plane fell. So very important to, to do the site inspection uh, at, 
at, at the time of day or very close to the time of the day when the incident occurred. Also take into account uh, daylight savings time and standard time. If it happened in the summer, uh, 1 a.m. Uh, or like, like I said earlier, 5 p.m. Uh, in the summer is different than 5 p.m. in the winter. Uh, just some more definitions, terminology that I, I put into uh, the report. Again, Tom will be more than happy to, uh, to provide these with you, uh, for you. Uh, but let me just go back. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the more fancy words we use in, this, uh, in doing these is tripometer. It sounds like tripometer, but it's called tripometer. Uh, it's an apparatus used to measure the frictional forces acting at an interface between a walkway surface and a shoe material. So this next photo I have is what is considered the latest and greatest in the industry. This is called the BOT 3000E machine. This uh, machine, it's about the size of a shoebox, requires very little user input, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, other devices such as sled machines or, or drag machines, which are placed on the ground and basically have a string or a rope, and the user has to basically pull or drag the machine across the floor to get a reading of the coefficient of friction. As you, know, as you can imagine, a drag machine like that will, is highly dependent on the person who is dragging the machine. If they pull it at uh, an angle that's more upward, it could affect the way it's dragging across the floor. Mm -hmm. This BOT 3000E machine, uh, the user places the machine on the ground, presses a few buttons, the machine does it all itself, it takes a picture of the uh, area that's uh, being tested and it gives you readouts which cannot be tampered with. So it's a very uh, good machine in, 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 in the, in the uh, uh, it, it, can, it cannot be tampered with is what I'm trying to say. It's, I don't want to say it's foolproof because the test foot that is put on the bottom of it does have to be cleaned periodically. There is a methodology that has to be followed, but uh, as far as getting the results themselves, it's a matter of pressing a few buttons. Uh, we've been using that for the last couple of years. Very expensive machine, a uh, very reliable machine. It does need to be uh, calibrated uh, at least once a year. Uh, that validation should be uh, put in with the report. So, uh, so the judge or, uh, or whoever is taking a close look at the, uh, the report knows that the machine uh, is, uh, is calibrated properly. Uh, let's see, how are we doing in time? We still have about 15 minutes left. Uh, I, I talked about gait and how gait patterns can change over time from an infant to someone midlife to someone who's elderly. Basically, this is just a, uh, a free body diagram, a sketch of how, uh, how a person walks. Uh, they have um, a heel strike, uh, they have a push off, and, uh, and then they have a, a toe push off. So this is basically just a very a rudimentary diagram of, uh, of walking mechanics. And uh, very important uh, to understand that, that, that uh, walking mechanics uh, can be broken down uh, uh, many times, more often, lately, we're looking at cases where video is available. And through video, we can, uh, with good video, we can see if it's a, a matter of someone's ankle turning. We can see if it's a matter, or matter of somebody's toe uh, getting hung up on a, an elevated edge. Or we could see if, uh, if somebody's heel is slipping on a contamination on the floor. So just uh, very, very important to, to, uh, to know the, the, the terminology and how GATE works. When we're talking about the um, definitions, one of the definitions I think I skipped over is camouflage. Uh, this was taken at one of my site inspections a few years ago. Uh, the background story of this is, uh, well, you could see the sidewalk. You could see on the right-hand side of the picture, there was a tree which was cut down. Uh, the tree had a pretty large root, which affected the, uh, the sidewalk adjacent to the tree, which caused the sidewalk to crack and lift, which caused about uh, an inch or an inch and a half vertical separation between sidewalk panels. Uh, the story is an elderly woman was dropped off by her, her daughter. Uh, the elderly woman stood in this location facing the street at this, her feet were placed in 
uh, just adjacent to the, the sidewalk panel that was raised. Her daughter went and parked the car and uh, she waited for her daughter so they could go to the, uh, so they could go uh, have lunch together. So in the time she's standing there, uh, the location where this uh, uh, separation and elevation is actually out of her field of view. It's basically right at her feet. Uh, any person standing uh, there, you, you typically, unless you look straight down through your peripheral vision, you do not see the tip of your toes or the sides of your shoes. Um, so the, we were actually working on the defense side of this. We did this little exemplar out here at the same time of the day. And we, so we, once we did this, we understood that this woman who was standing here, um, had, standing here for a couple of minutes, uh, maybe when she got out of the car, she saw the uh, change in elevation. However, after a couple of minutes, that's no longer in her short-term memory. And even if she did look down, her own shadow is obscuring the, uh, the change in elevation. So very important to do these um, site inspections uh, as soon as possible so we can see the conditions the way they were or as close as possible to the way they were. And again, I know I sound like a broken record, uh, doing them as close to the time of day as possible so we can see if there was a shadow or something like that that may have affected the person's ability to see the area. Uh, foveal vision, um, this is basically just the line of sight. I'm gonna skip through that. Uh, peripheral vision as this pertains to our, our, our woman who, uh, who was standing at this location. You can see that peripheral vision is about 130 degrees uh, horizontal and about uh, 130 degrees uh, vertical. So clearly this woman standing next to the sidewalk, this was out of her peripheral vision. She could, uh, unless she was walking and approaching it, um, the way she was standing there, it's completely out of her field of vision. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, line of sight and sight triangles. Now this photograph uh, or this, uh, uh, this uh, slide I have here shows a pretty ideal line of sight with, uh, although there are trees uh, next to the curb and in the sidewalk, there is uh, nothing that's blocking uh, the sight triangle. Uh, I rarely ever see this in, uh, in real conditions. In fact, in my own neighborhood, uh, there are bushes that, uh, that block the line of sight. So when I drive to work every morning and I try to make my right hand turn, I have to creep out a little bit into the lane because there are bushes that obscure the oncoming traffic. Um, worked on a number of these cases where um, many times when a case comes in, it's the, uh, the drivers or multiple drivers or sometimes pedestrians that are involved in the case. Uh, there have been times where, uh, where uh, adjacent property owners have been brought into the case for not, a, uh, for not maintaining their property for uh, proper uh, sight lines and sight triangles. So just another thing to consider, uh, again, uh, the time of year is very important to do the inspection. For example, in the middle of the winter, the shrubs or trees may not be in full bloom and may not give you an accurate picture of what the, uh, how a sight triangle uh, may be obscured as compared to uh, uh, the, the foliage or flowers that might be on, uh, <coughs> present during uh, spring or summer. So very important to consider, uh, uh, to consider all of that. Um, uh, another uh, two factors are, I'm gonna toggle between these two slides, is horizontal curves, which is uh, the sight line, uh, which you see horizontally for oncoming traffic, and then vertical curves. Uh, basically, um, sometimes we see this uh, situation where there is an intersection and there is a hill a couple hundred feet away from the intersection and someone trying to make a left-hand turn uh, and turns out and they get rear-ended uh, because they don't see the car approaching uh, above the hill. So, um, so again, uh, very important concepts to understand the horizontal curve, which can sometimes, where these blue lines are shown here, can sometimes be obscured by, uh, by bushes or shrubs. Um, whereas the, uh, the vertical, uh, uh, the line of sight for on a vertical curve is basically the way the, the street or highway is designed 
and uh, in some cases maybe the uh, the authority that maintains that road might need to be brought in but again for these two again very important to get out there as soon as possible um, pavement markings change roads get reconstructed shrubbery trees get cut down and they grow so very important to get out there as soon as possible this um this next photo uh shows an older type uh, trebometer uh this was called the broom graber mark ii uh it's uh it's a mechanical device that measures coefficient of friction uh, in this case on the tread of a sidewalk i was talking about that antique store earlier the landing um above and the tread that the uh that the, uh, the, the, the parent who was chasing after their toddler did not see. One of the allegations was that the uh, tread was contaminated and that it was slippery in itself. Um, so we did a, we did a uh, coefficient of friction testing on the slate. We found that that was fine. <clears throat> it was more of a misstep that the parent simply could not see the, uh, the step as she had her uh, attention focused on her toddler. So th this was um, an interesting case that involved a slip and fall in a cafeteria. And you could see the vinyl tile floor, very typical that we see in many types of institutions like, like in school cafeterias or multi-purpose rooms. The allegation was that the, uh, the floor was unreasonably slippery after the custodian had mopped the floor. Uh, the, the background of this was it was uh, a woman who worked at the school, not for the school district, but for an outside agency who provided, uh, provided childcare at the school. She uh, discussed how she arrived at the school every day at the same time. And, and on this particular day, she walked through the cafeteria after it had been mopped and she slipped on the wet floor that, where there was no warning that the floor would be mopped. So if you notice, um, in the background toward the top center of the picture, there's a clock. Uh, we got testimony from the uh, custodian that he mops the floor 40 minutes uh, before she fell. This picture was taken at the time she fell and we were able to show that uh, at the time she fell compared to the time when the floor is mopped, it has ample time to dry and that the floor would not be wet. Uh, so we tested it in these conditions and found out it was fine. So, um, so uh, very important to know the background of a case. Uh, so when we, so when a site inspection is conducted, we can we can pin down all of the available information that we have. For example, when the custodian mops the floor and the time that she fell. Very important to nail those down. Had we not nailed those down, it would have seemed like a very uh, a very strong argument that uh, that the custodian mopped the floor. She walked by and slipped on the wet floor without any signs being available. So very important to understand that before we do an inspection. Um, I think we're getting, where are we on time? We're at- Jody, uh, hey Jody, it's Tom. I think we're, we're at the point where we wanna ask some questions now. Uh, okay, uh, all right, very good, Tom. Yeah, the, the, now there are quite a few more slides. Um, I, uh, yep. We won't go through, but Tom can give you, there's, a, there's only about eight more slides. Tom's happy to give you these, uh, this, this, uh, presentation in a PDF format. Uh, I'm usually available. If you have any questions, ask Tom, or you can always give me a call if there's a concept that you want to work through. So yeah, are there any questions, yeah. Tom? You know, Jody, I have a quick question. My first question would be, what sort of file materials do you need in order to start a human factors engineering investigation from our clients? Great question, Tom. So I'm gonna answer that in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is ideally I'd like to go out to a, and do a site inspection as early as possible before the conditions change. Now, I know that that is a big wish to ask for because many times we don't get the case until months later or even sometimes a year later. Uh, but some of the file materials I would like to see are the incident report. The incident report, I'd also like to see the EMS report, uh, the report from the uh, from the first responders. And I'd also like to see uh, the uh, emergency room reports. The reason I like to see those reports, Tom, is uh, typically those are what's recorded when it happens. 
and there's not much time between, say, for an example, if somebody slips and falls or falls down a step, they tell you exactly what happened. The story does not have the opportunity to evolve over time. So I like to see those uh, documents. I also like to review the uh, primary uh, doctor's reports to see if the, uh, the person had any prior medical conditions. Again, the knee replacement, the hip problems, the medication, the, uh, the eyewear, if they had any um, prescriptions, if they were supposed to be using a cane or a walker. We want to understand that. Um, we also want to take a look, if it's a grocery store, we want to take a look at um, maintenance or sweep logs. Uh, if it's a construction site, which we didn't get a chance to go through those slides, we want to take a look at the, um, the contracts between the, the, the developer, the, uh, the, the general contractor, the project manager, and the subs to see who is responsible. We also want to look at diary notes from the contractor to see who was at the site uh, at a particular time. So um, it really depends on the case, Tom. If there's ever a question, we, uh, we have a, a list already written up of file materials we'd like to review. If, any, if anyone out there uh, has a case that uh, they're not quite sure what they need to look at, give me or Tom a call. Uh, we're happy to tell you the types of materials you should be uh, acquiring. What we do, we, we do it more often uh, lately, is we get OPRA requests. An OPRA request is an Open Public Records Act request from the township. In fact, uh, I just asked Carol before I walked into this discussion to uh, do an OPRA request for a property that we're working on. The, um, the township maintains uh, plans and they maintain building permits and certificate of occupancy. Uh, they maintain those. They're great resources for us to look at to see when a building was modified. They also uh, sometimes have copies of the plans, which uh, could sometimes be difficult to obtain from contractors. So, Tom, it's hard to answer that question to tell you everything I need, but that kind of gives you a snapshot. Yeah, it, it is uh, unique to the type of case, but uh, uh, basically, I always tell the adjuster or the attorney, the more information I have, the better we can prepare ourselves for the case. And one more question, Jody. I'm assuming the timeliness in you getting the file material is equally important. That, that's a great point, Tom. It, it is. Uh, I'd rather jump on these cases sooner rather than later. Again, I, I understand many times we, we don't get the case, the attorneys don't get the case until there's a month left in the discovery process. I get it. Um, but if we do have the opportunity on other cases uh, where we do have the luxury of time, I'd rather get everything sooner rather than later so we can develop the case and possibly identify other uh, defendants uh, that may be involved. For example, uh, I'm involved in a case, we got involved very early where a, uh, a woman was injured at a restaurant and we got involved within months and uh, and we were out there very quickly, uh, very shortly after it occurred, and we were able to identify before the, the statute ran out that we were able to name the architect in the case also, and, and one of the contractors. So very important uh, to get me or someone like me involved in the case and uh, try to work through it so we can identify those other defendants. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Jody. I'm going to turn this over to Brittany with PAMIC now as she, she, she'd like to make some comments and wrap things up for us today. Brittany, it's yours. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And again, thank you, Tom and Jody, for providing this intel for us as it was very informative and both helpful to all of our members. And again, if anyone watching, if you would like to rewatch this webinar, it will be on demand on the PAMIC website. And if you would like the slide deck from um, this presentation today, you can either contact myself, Brittany, at PAMIC or Tom O'Brien of FCNA Partners. And just to wrap up and finalize, I just wanted to say thank you all for attending and PAMIC wishes you a well, safe, and happy Thanksgiving next week. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. We uh, this presentation is available at, at, on a PDF, so feel free to contact me and, and I can send it to you. Thanks, Jody. Thank you, have a great day.